This week, we will look at our first case study of how Latin American cultures have been shaped by power and politics by considering a selection of pre-Hispanic kingdoms and empires. Pre-Hispanic simply means before the Spaniards, and pre-Columbian means before Columbus, so I may use those terms interchangeably. Unfortunately, we only have so much time in this course and we cannot cover everything. Instead, I want us to zero in on the three largest and most powerful pre-Hispanic polities, the Maya kingdoms, the Aztec or Mexica empire, and the Inca empire. One fascinating pattern that we can see is that in all three cases, the system of religious beliefs and practices supported very powerful dynasties and political expansionism. This is the Maya region. It includes the northern lowlands, including the entire Yucatan Peninsula, the country of Belize on the Caribbean coast, and the northern region of Guatemala. Then there are the southern highlands, including the Mexican state of Chiapas, southern Guatemala, El Salvador, and northern Honduras. The so-called Maya family of languages includes 31 separate languages. The Maya were never unified as an empire, but there were vast differences in degree of political power across time and space. In what is called the Classic Period, AD 250 to 900, the greatest concentration of population and cities was in the southern highlands of Mexico and Guatemala, although there were important lowland sites as well. The Maya kingdoms consisted of city-states headed by dynastic rulers, each with their own provinces. The rulers sometimes went to war to gain new subjects from which they could then demand tributary goods and labor. These classic period cities, to support their denser populations, combined Swidden agriculture with more intensive forms of cultivation, including intensive backyard gardens, orchards, terracing, and some raised fields. Pictured here is the city of Tikal in Guatemala, which at its height had a population of around 50,000 people, which made it one of the largest cities anywhere in the world during the first millennium AD. By way of contrast, here is the lowland city of Uxmal in the state of Yucatan. The ancient Maya cities were characterized by complex architecture, including pyramids, palaces, and administrative buildings. All of the stone buildings were covered in plaster, which was then carved and painted. The paint has since worn away. The ancient Maya sustained a population of craftspeople who produced astounding pieces of artisanry given the tools available to them at the time. Here's one example. It is a very small sculpture made from a single piece of obsidian, which is volcanic glass. The sculpture was formed by napping, which means breaking off flakes of the stone by striking or pressing one piece with another. This piece is about 10 inches long, and if you look closely, you can see the hundreds of very precise strikes that would have been necessary to create this ornate piece. It is called an eccentric because of its irregular shape. This eccentric represents a mythological scene of deities ascending into the underworld in a crocodile canoe. The Maya had specialists in pottery, various types of sculpture, stoneworking, painting, featherworking, and weaving. The ancient Maya also supported a population of scholars, scribes, and priests. They developed a system of hieroglyphic writing that was absolutely unique in that it contained both phonetic and ideographic elements. The phonetic elements were those which represented sounds. Our alphabet is a phonetic system, of course. The ideographic elements were those that represented ideas. Another example is Chinese script. The Maya hieroglyphs combined the phonetic and the ideographic. For example, you might have an image of a bull but then a phonetic element representing the L sound. That would tell you that the glyph refers to the bull with the L sound. 
Maya hieroglyphs were commonly inscribed on buildings and monuments in city centers, and in those locations they often recorded the historical acts of kings and nobles. Ancient Maya scribes also, however, wrote books in which they recorded medical, calendrical, and historical knowledge. These books included paintings and glyphs on paper made from the bark of a fig tree. The bark was removed in long segments, treated, softened, and folded in accordion style to form the pages. This kind of book is called a codex, codices plural. Only four Maya codices survive today. Some were lost and decayed over time. Others were destroyed intentionally by Spanish friars who saw them as the work of the devil, as idolatries. These are the pages from a book now known as the Dresden Codex. The Maya also had an advanced system of mathematics. They had the first numerical system in the world to include and rely upon the concept of zero. It had place value notation, or positional value notation, which meant, in effect, that a limited number of signs could be used to generate an infinite number of values. Because zero was fixed, the value of the other signs was affected by their physical relationship to zero. Zero was represented by the two nested ovals, a circle represented one, and a bar represented five. It was a vigesimal or base 20 system as compared with our decimal or base 10 system. The place value notation worked in this way. Zero was understood to be at the bottom, and then circles and bars were stacked on top. An infinite number of values could be represented by stacking higher and higher. Compare this with the Roman numerical system used in Europe at the same time, in which for each order of magnitude a new letter had to be used. I, V, X, L, C, M, etc. The Maya mathematical system was used in their system of astronomy, which was also very advanced in the world for that time. They made observations of the moon, sun, the planet Venus, and also comets. These observations informed their calendar and a system of prognostication. Astronomy was also built into the architecture. For example, consider this small building at Zibil Chaltun. On the equinox, therefore twice a year, the rising sun would shine directly through this portal in the Temple of the Seven Dolls. This coordination of math, astronomy, and public architecture would have symbolized to the peasantry the special knowledge of the elites. Here is another example of that coordination of astronomy and architecture. For many of the ancient Middle American cultures, a major god was the feathered serpent. In the Maya languages, he was known as Kukulkan, meaning feathered serpent. This building is the Gran Castillo, the central pyramid at the ancient northern Yucatecan site of Chichen Itza. This photo was taken on the spring equinox when the angle of the sunlight hits just right in the afternoon so that the serpent, which flanks the central staircase, is illuminated. Here is a clear example of the relationship between dynastic power and religion in the ancient Maya cultures. In most of the ancient Middle American religions, it was said that the universe had been created and destroyed multiple times and that we are in the era of the fifth sun. Humans and deities were linked in a relationship of reciprocity. The deities had made human existence possible, and they could bestow more blessings on humans, and in turn, humans needed to do their part to sustain the gods. Humans could do so through offerings, typically of food, but sometimes of other things, including blood. Ideas about the power of blood sustained dynastic power, too. The royals engaged in auto-sacrifice, letting their own blood, which was offered up to the deities. 
This carved stone lintel from Yashtilan in Chiapas records a bloodletting ceremony by Lord Bird Jaguar and one of his wives, Lady Balam Ish. This lintel is housed in the British Museum in London, and this analysis is from a book by Linda Sheely called The Blood of Kings. In this image, the Lord and Lady are letting their own blood. Lady Balam Ish, on the left, has cut a slice in her tongue through which she is passing a rope. Lord Bird Jaguar is piercing his penis, probably with a stingray spine. You can see below the rope that the blood is spilling onto paper in a bowl. The paper would then be burned and the rising smoke from the blood would nourish the gods. In the rising smoke, a vision serpent would appear and communicate important messages from the deities to those offering the sacrifice. These visions were understood to be a manifestation of the power of royal blood, so you can see how these religious beliefs and practices would have helped reinforce the political power of the royals. In this other lintel from Yashchilan, you can see the vision serpent appearing in the smoke that is rising up from the bowl. In this vision, he delivers a message to Lady Six Tun, another wife of Bird Jaguar. Religious beliefs about the importance of offerings to the deities also fueled warfare among neighboring Maya city-states. Warfare had both economic and religious dimensions. Through warfare, the royal family of one city could gain dominance over another city from which they could then exact tributary goods and labor. Captured soldiers could also be offered up as sacrificial offerings to the deities through which leaders could demonstrate to the peasants their important religious role. This carved lentil shows a Maya military leader delivering bound captive soldiers to a ruler seated below a throne. The ancient Maya engaged in human sacrifice to a lesser extent than did the Aztecs. There is also no evidence of cannibalism among the ancient Maya. It is important to note that even though the ancient Maya did not have firearms or metal weaponry and armor, they did have significant military technology. Remember the obsidian volcanic glass that I mentioned before? Multiple obsidian blades would be embedded in a wooden club, and those multiple sharp edges might have done just as much damage as an iron sword. Also, their bows and arrows in the hands of a skillful hunter and soldier would have been more accurate than the musket rifles of the time. For armor, they used thick cotton armor and they had wooden shields. Around AD 900, there was a significant shift in the distribution of population and power within the Maya region. Many of the southern city-states went into decline losing almost all of their population and signs of dynastic rule. This has sometimes been called the Maya collapse, but the Maya definitely did not disappear. While the southern cities went into decline, there was a growth of population and powerful cities in the northern lowlands. This drawing represents one such city, Chichen Itza, meaning the well of the Itza, who were a dynastic lineage. What were the reasons for the decline of the classic sites? There were probably multiple, including deforestation related to population pressure, intensive building, and insufficient fallowing of agricultural lands. We know from the Spanish colonial period that the Maya had a culture of voting with their feet. In other words, if the rulers became too greedy and placed too many demands on the peasants, in the form of taxes, forced labor, and forced military service, they would pick up and relocate to a less populated region where they could live autonomously. The classic period royals may have placed too many demands and then faced peasant revolts or simply peasant abandonment. Natural disasters could have played a role. There are indications of droughts, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions around this time. 
The royals and nobles might also have been attracted to the goods they could secure from seafaring trade along the coast. At the time of the arrival of the Spaniards, the Maya carried out extensive trade along the coast in large canoes, sometimes 40 feet in length, and they went as far west as central Mexico and then all along the eastern coast of Central America. At the time of the arrival of the Spaniards, there were 17 different Maya provinces just in the Yucatan Peninsula, each with its own dynastic lineage. Now let's look at the ancient Mexica or Aztec Empire. The empire was expansionistic. At the time of the arrival of Hernán Cortés in the Valley of Mexico in 1519, the valley was divided into 50 different city-states. The city of Tenochtitlan was ruled by the Mexica lineage. In the roughly 100 years prior to that, roughly 1427 to 1500, Tenochtitlan had joined into a triple alliance with two other cities, Texcoco and Tlacopan, and then gained dominance within that alliance. From their capital in the middle of Lake Texcoco, the Mexica extended their rule over large parts of central Mexico. A testament to their political centralization was the size of the capital. In 1519, Tenochtitlan was one of the largest cities in the world with 150,000 to 200,000 inhabitants, five times the size of London at the same time. Like the Inca Empire, the Aztec Empire was a tributary state. The Aztecs would defeat the ruling elites of cities and then exact tribute from them. They did not impose their own rulers on the cities, but relied on indirect rule by giving privileges to local nobles. We will see this kind of indirect rule later in the Spanish colonial period. This map lets you see the extent of Aztec power but also how quickly they had risen. This rapid rise would have meant that at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards, the Aztecs had many enemies among their imperial subjects. Bernal Diaz del Castillo was a soldier who accompanied Hernán Cortés in his travels to the Valley of Mexico. He wrote a lengthy account of their travels and exploits. Cortés's men entered the city on November 8, 1519, and Diaz del Castillo wrote, quote, With such wonderful eyes to gaze on, we did not know what to say, or if this was real that we saw before our eyes. On the land side, there were great cities, and on the lake, many more. The lake was crowded with canoes. At intervals along the causeway, there were many bridges, and before us was the great city of Mexico. This image is a detail from a larger mural by Diego Rivera. We will see more of his work later in this course. This part of the mural represents Tenochtitlan with the emperor Moctezuma seated on his throne. He is commonly called Montezuma in the US, which is in part due to the fact that Diaz del Castillo misrepresented his name. Diaz del Castillo continued his account, quote, when we came near to Mexico, the great Montezuma descended from his litter, and these other great chiefs supported him beneath a marvelously rich canopy of green feathers, decorated with gold work, silver, pearls, and a stone that we now know as jade, which hung from a sort of border. It was a marvelous sight. The great Montezuma was magnificently clad and wore sandals, the soles of which are of gold and the upper parts ornamented with precious stones. Diaz del Castillo was transfixed. Quote, I must now speak of the skilled workmen whom Montezuma employed in all the crafts they practiced. Beginning with the jewelers and workers in silver and gold and various kinds of hollowed objects, which excited the admiration of our great silversmiths at home. There were other skilled craftsmen who worked with precious stones and jade and specialists in feather work and very fine painters and carvers. 
there are three Indians who are such magnificent painters and carvers that had they lived in the age of the Apelles of old or of Michelangelo or Berughetti in our own day, they would be counted in that same rank. Let us go on to the women, the weavers and seamstresses who made such a huge quantity of fine robes with very elaborate feathered designs. We must not forget the gardens with their many varieties of flowers and sweet scented trees planted in order and baths. Everything was built of stone and plastered, baths and walks and closets and rooms like summer houses where they danced and sang. There was so much to see in these gardens as everywhere else that we could not tire of contemplating his great riches. The religious system of the Mexica bore many similarities to that of the ancient Maya, and similarly it helped support the power of the royals. Quetzalcoatl, whose name means feathered serpent, was the god of air and life. In this panel from a 16th century codex, Quetzalcoatl is represented on the right. The Mexica, like the Maya, believed that the universe had already been created and destroyed four times and that this was the fifth sun. After the most recent destruction of the universe, Quetzalcoatl went down to the underworld and gathered up all the bones of past generations. He sprinkled them with his own blood, thus recreating humanity. Humans thus owed their existence to the gods, and the gods would be repaid through the offerings of blood and human hearts. Just as in the ancient Maya kingdoms, many sacrificial victims were captives from warfare, hence these religious practices would have enhanced the power and prestige of the rulers as military commanders. According to Diaz del Castillo, quote, they strike open the wretched Indian's chest with flint knives and hastily tear out the palpitating heart which, with the blood, they present to the idols in whose name they have performed the sacrifice. Then they cut off the arms, thighs, and head, eating the arms and thighs at their ceremonial banquets. The head they hang up on a beam, and the body of the sacrificed man is not eaten but given to the beasts of prey. End quote. The myth of Huitzilopochtli was even more central to the logic of sacrifice. Huitzilopochtli was the patron deity of the Mexica. In other words, he protected and sustained them and them alone. Huitzilopochtli was thought to be embodied in the sun. It was believed that the sun is weak. Huitzilopochtli, as the sun, is a young warrior who dies every night as he goes into the underworld. If he has the strength, however, he is born again every morning in the womb of the earth. Each morning, then, the young warrior, armed with the fire serpent, has to fight off his sister, Koyol Shauki, who is the moon, and his brothers, the stars. This image from a post-conquest period codex shows Huitzilopochtli killing Koyalshauki and her 400 brothers. By winning this daily struggle, Huitzilopochtli ensures a new day of life for humanity. If he is not reborn every morning, all life would cease. Humans could feed the sun, Huitzilopochtli, by offering it blood, and this would keep the sun going on its journey. The Mexica, who called themselves the people of the sun, declared that they were chosen to be warriors to feed the sun through engaging in sacred war and human sacrifice. What would have been the political impact of this system of religious beliefs and practices? The sustained system of warfare and sacrifice would have intimidated both conquered subjects of the Aztec Empire as well as those of neighboring city-states. Rulers from neighboring city-states were in fact invited to witness the sacrifices, and those sacrificed and eaten before them might have been their own warriors. Those neighbors would have thought twice before taking on the Aztec armies. Deborah Nichols, an Aztec specialist, 
has suggested that the scale of sacrifice during the height of the Aztec Empire was so great precisely because the Aztecs were such a new political group on the scene, because they wanted to impose an empire in a region that already had many powerful city-states, they needed to intimidate their rivals and also make sure that their peasants and soldiers were willing to participate in their military ventures. Finally, let us consider the Inca Empire. The Inca created the largest ancient empire in the Americas and had the most sophisticated political administration. The Inca, strictly speaking, were one of several kingdoms in the Andes. The Incas were the rulers, not all of the people they subjected, who in fact were of distinctive linguistic and ethnic groups. The Incas spoke Quechua, and the spread of the Quechua language coincided with the rise of the Inca Empire. The Inca capital was Cusco in modern-day Peru, and beginning around 1425, Inca rulers expanded their empire as far north as Ecuador and as far south as northern Chile and Argentina. The empire was still expanding at the time of the Spanish arrival in 1532. Here is a colonial period representation of the ruler who founded Cusco around A.D. 1200, Manco Capac. You can see him pointing to the sun, which is important as the Inca rulers claimed that they were descendants of Inti, the sun god. Just like the Aztec Empire, the Inca Empire was expansionistic and tributary, meaning that they would conquer other kingdoms in battle and then require tribute of their new subjects. Just as did the Aztec rulers, the Inca rulers ruled indirectly. They left local rulers, Curacas, in place. The Curacas were given special privileges and then were given responsibility for local everyday administration and tribute collection. The Inca imposed a much more centralized and comprehensive system of administration as compared with the Aztec Empire. The work of the Inca Empire was made possible by a system of tributary labor called Mita. This was an ancient tradition in the Andes, and we will see it in operation again in the Spanish colonial period. The Mita system supplied labor for military service, agriculture, and the construction of public works, including terraces, irrigation canals, roads, and various public stone buildings. The Inca had a redistributive economy in that the state demanded goods and labor, but was also expected to redistribute goods to subjects in need. Goods were stored in imperial warehouses throughout the empire, and laborers were rewarded with goods from these warehouses. In times of scarcity, local people could use food from warehouses and pay it back the following year. The Inca administrative system was remarkable given the technological limitations of the time, as well as the physical challenge posed by the rugged mountain terrain. The Inca maintained a system of roads 11,000 miles in length. Suspension bridges made of grass rope connected hillside peaks. This drawing is of a 19th century rope suspension bridge that was still in use at the time. All along these roads were imperial warehouses. A system of relay runners passed messages throughout the region and these runners could cover 1,500 to 2,000 kilometers per week. Another important element of the Inca and pre-Inca administrative systems were quipus, which were collections of colored knotted cords. The ancient Indians did not have a system of writing, but they used these quipus to record information. It is believed that the colors of the threads and the numbers and positions of the knots recorded information, perhaps population, tribute, and trade records. The ancient Indians also demonstrated incredible art and artisanry. Whereas the ancient Maya fitted the stones of their public buildings together with mortar, the ancient Indians did not. They carved each individual stone to fit securely next to the others, and the stones were held in place by their own weight. 
All of this work was done with stone tools. Some of these stones were 12 feet tall and 20 feet wide. They had no pulleys, but they moved the stones into place with levers. Here's another photo showing the precision of this architectural work. The ancient Andean people did mine and work precious metals. It should be noted that their metalwork was rare and largely preserved for royal and noble houses. They did not mine extensively. That would come later in the Spanish colonial period. The ancient Andeans mined for both gold and silver. They did not melt and cast the metals, but hammered and incised them. Their metalwork was decorative rather than pragmatic. They did not use metal tools. Gold and silver are both too soft to be effective as tools. Here is an example of hammered and incised silver from the Inca period. Llamas were used as pack animals, a role for which they were very useful in the high mountainous region. Weavings may have been the most elaborate art of the ancient Andeans. Unfortunately, few examples have survived into the present. Cloth does not survive over time the way that pottery and stone do. Most of what we know of ancient Andean weaving comes from contemporary drawings and paintings. Just as for the ancient Maya and Aztecs, the Inca system of religious beliefs helps sustain the power of the royals. The ancient Andeans had the concept of a waka, which was something sacred. Certain objects, places, and people could be wakas. Wakas could be given offerings of food, beverages, and textiles. The ancient Andeans very rarely engaged in human sacrifice, although they did sacrifice animals, and a llama was the most valuable animal offering. All ancestors were wakas, and some ancestors were preserved as mummies, in particular, the mummies of the royals. The most sacred of the ancestral mummies were given offerings as well. This image from Guaman Poma's book is of the mummy of a ruler being brought out and paraded around on a litter. The most important god for the Incas was the sun god, Inti. Again, the Inca rulers claimed that they were descended from Inti, a belief that gave them a sense of divine blessing and also divine rights. Here's another image from Guaman Poma's book, an image representing devotions to a waka. The inscription reads, the waka's idols of the Koyasuyus. You can see the mummy bundle preserved in a mountain cave, and two nobles are on their way to sacrifice a llama to the mummy. The noble on the right may be carrying a bundle of coca leaves to give as an offering. I hope you will remember this image when, later in the course, we watch the film The Devil's Minor. Just as among the Maya and the Aztecs, warfare was connected to the system of religious beliefs and practices, although more indirectly so. In the Inca Empire, warfare was more explicitly economic. Soldiers and officers were promised that they would get a share of the spoils of war including agricultural lands and tribute from those newly conquered. Inca warfare did not involve the capture of soldiers to be sacrificed. However, Inca warfare was motivated in part by their unique political structure. The ruling Inca was called the Sapa Inca. When the Sapa Inca died, his heir, the new Sapa Inca, did not inherit any material wealth, just the title. The siblings of the Sapa Inca inherited the wealth in part because it was their responsibility to care for the mummy, the waka, of their deceased father. If the new Sapa Inca wanted to have any wealth at all, he had to conquer new kingdoms. Thus, expansion was built into the system. Just like the Aztec Empire, the Incas had expanded their empire very quickly and thus, at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards, they had many enemies in the region. That is it for our look at the ancient kingdoms and empires.